Uh, you should uh, seek shelter immediately. The roaring became terrifically loud. I knew I was in big trouble. You kept wondering if something's going to hit you or you're going to live or you're going to die. Emergency crews say that Pierce City is leveled and several people are trapped. I knew that nobody would know where to look for me. It's just a nightmare. You just you look at it, you couldn't believe it. From the Weather Channel, this is Storm Stories with meteorologist Jim Cantore. It's been a while since we've seen this many supercell uh, thunderstorms producing tornadoes. Early May 2003, a devastating outbreak of tornadoes pummels sections of the Midwest. During a one-week period, nearly 400 twisters touch down in 25 states. One of these tornadoes will strike Pierce City, Missouri, demolishing the century-old town in a matter of minutes. It's Sunday, May 4th. Dave Sanders heads for his workshop in downtown Pierce City. The 52-year-old artist moved to this community in the late 1980s. What attracted me to the town was the uh, architecture. There were a lot of Victorian, turn-of-the-century buildings that gave it a unique atmosphere that I enjoyed. In recent years, Pierce City has experienced a revival. New shops, cafes, and art galleries fill the downtown's historic buildings. Sanders lives and works in a 117-year-old structure, which once housed the town's opera house. The great part about the opera hall is having so much room. It's 50 feet wide, 100 feet long, and about 15,000 square feet. Today, Sanders is building one of his most popular items, a piece of driftwood furniture. Engrossed in his work, he is unaware that a threatening storm is moving toward Pier City. 50 miles east in Springfield, Missouri, KOLR-TV meteorologist Ted Keller is transfixed by his radar screen. Keller and his colleagues notice an ominous weather pattern. Cool, dry air from the Rockies and warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico are colliding right over southwestern Missouri. The result, three powerful supercell thunderstorms with enough strength to produce multiple tornadoes. What was starting to worry us was that every single time we looked at that, the worse it looked. This is not just an ordinary severe weather outbreak day. There's something extraordinary about this. By 5.30 p.m., the storms have spawned a series of twisters. This is senior meteorologist Ted Keller tracking some very dangerous storms across southwest Missouri. It was really looking bad and we had a lot of concern. These killer tornadoes that lasted for hours and it filled us with a lot of uh, tension about what could happen to us. Thirty-nine-year-old Julie Johnson knows that bad weather is predicted for Pierce City. Yet she is not concerned. Living here most of her life, she's never seen a twister. To Julie, storms and tornado sirens are just part of summer in her hometown. It's like second nature here. You know, there can be a thunderstorm, and we've had the sirens go off many times. It's just the same old, same old for here, as far as I was concerned. That afternoon, Julie and her sister Janine decide to go shopping in a nearby town. They drive home around 6.30 p.m. Julie hopes that by now the bad weather has passed them by. She turns on the car radio for a weather report just in time to hear a news flash for her county. Now just getting a tornado warning just issued for Lawrence County. That's Lawrence County until 745. As the sisters get closer to home, they hear tornado sirens blaring through the city. There is something about today's warning that puts Julie on edge. She and her sister decide to head for cover. But first, Julie stops home to get her two cats. If I'm going to be in danger and they're going to be in danger, they're going to, we're going to be together. Next, they head straight for the safety of the town's storm shelter, the National Guard Armory. That's always been known as a tornado shelter. If you don't have a basement or something, that's where you go. The stone fortress was built in 1940 in the center of town. It was designed to house tanks and ammunition 
and is regarded as the strongest building in Pier City. A block from the armory, Dave Sanders has closed his workshop for the day. He can hear the sirens loud and clear from his second floor apartment. The sirens, tornado sirens, which were located across the street from me, were blasting away. So I turned on the television to watch the weather channel. The uh, radar indicated that the storm had passed to our northwest, and then the sirens stopped. And I looked out the south end of the building, and I could see blue skies, and it looked like everything was clearing up. I felt that we were out of the woods at that point. Residents taking shelter inside the armory also think the worst is over. Many begin to venture outside. Julie Johnson and her sister are just pulling up when they see people leaving the building. When we got there, there was already a lot of people there. There's a lot of people standing outside looking at the sky. The sisters decide not to take any chances and take cover inside the armory. Seven miles west, a powerful supercell drops a tornado from the sky. And it is heading straight for Pier City. 36-year-old John Vincent, a local firefighter, is tracking the storm in his car when he sees the funnel touch down. Just like a serpentine, white serpentine tail came down. And then it broke up. Looked like it didn't really go back up. It just kind of disappeared and then come back down again. Everything kind of happened really quick. The twister develops into an F3, the third strongest level on the Fujita scale that rates a tornado strength. Vincent watches as the twister rolls through the outskirts of town. You can see the, like the dirt, just the brown, brownish gray stuff, you know, filled, filled the tornado. And then all of a sudden the, the debris started. I don't know exactly if it was tin or if it was uh, insulation or what. You can see it going up and falling and just flying every which way. Vincent knows the twister is on a collision course with Pier City. Within seconds, it reaches town. The people outside the armory have little time to react as the powerful tornado barrels toward them. I just saw everybody start, all of a sudden just started to run. I was just shocked. I thought there should be somebody ho hollering that. Here it is, here it comes, hide, run. Winds gust at nearly 200 miles an hour as debris rockets through the air. The sound was very, very loud. I keep saying it sounds like a train, That's a train. and it did. The roar, the roar, the roar. Julie and her sister scramble to get downstairs into the armory basement, but they're blocked by a mob of panicked people. The two sisters have no choice but to run for cover in a first-floor bathroom. We just got in to sit down, and so we put our cat carriers down in front of us and knelt down in the bathroom. It was right next to one another. Moments later, the tornado churns through downtown Pier City. Powerful winds rip up century-old elm trees. Parked cars are hurled into the air and drop like toys. Then, the monster slams into the strongest building in town, the armor. You could hear things hitting, you know, like hitting the building. You could hear like popping, cracking electric lines inside the building. You stood there and like held on to see what happened. I was wondering if the roof was going to fall in. Are we going to make it? Um, is this, is, am I going to die? Are we going to die? Is this it? A block away, Dave Sanders sees the twister tearing apart the armory from his second floor window. He is frozen by the incredible scene. I saw the, the roof collapse on the armory. And um, then just a few seconds later, uh, I saw a large section of the, my roof flying across the street and smashing into the building. Sanders has watched the destruction for too long. He realizes that the tornado has taken hold of his building and bolts for the door. Got about halfway across the living room and the roaring and noise from the debris falling was, was tremendous. I heard bricks falling. I felt the falling sensation. Suddenly, the floor gives way and Sanders plummets into the room below. He loses consciousness as the building collapses all around him. Moments later, the terrible force leaves Pier City. It continues moving eastward for another 40 miles, destroying everything in its path. Firefighter John Vincent is one of the first rescuers to arrive at the scene. 
it was just uh, it was just devastation. The, the whole downtown was, you know, pretty well gone. The National Guard armory has been torn apart. Several people are buried inside. Local news stations spread the word. Emergency crews say that Pierce City is leveled and several people are trapped in the armory there in Pierce City. There could be dozens trapped. It is early evening, May 4th, 2003. More than 30 twisters have ripped through parts of the Midwest, killing at least 13 people. In southwestern Missouri, an F3 tornado has shattered the town of Pierce City, leaving a path of destruction in its wake. The town's storm shelter, the National Guard Armory, has been pounded by the twister. Firefighter John Vincent frantically digs through the rubble, searching for survivors. There was just debris everywhere, uh, you know, electric poles, lines, telephone lines, roofing material, building material. The roof was off of it, and it was all, you know, beat up and everything. Vincent is worried the tattered building could give way at any moment. His rescue mission becomes a race against time. We were just worried about the roof coming in on top of them and then the I-beams that held, held the trusses were actually pulling away from the wall there. You know, we occasionally looked back and you could tell that it was, the gap was getting bigger. While some survivors are pulled from the wreckage, others must make it out on their own. Julie Johnson and her sister Janine, along with Julie's two cats, had taken shelter in the armory's first floor bathroom. They escaped the twister unharmed, but now they have to crawl over mounds of rubble to get outside. When they emerge, they are stunned by what has happened to their hometown. Julie can barely recognize the streets in front of her. The town was a mess, and um, we stood there for just a minute, and you're just taking all you're just in shock. She has only one thing on her mind. All I could think in my head was, I want to get home. I want to see if I've got a home. Julie's car has been destroyed, so she and her sister walk home through the debris-clogged roads. Finally, they reach Julie's street, only to discover that a large tree has been hurled on top of her house. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. I've lived here all my life. I've heard many sirens in my lifetime. I didn't think it ever hit here. I never thought it hit my home, and it did. And it just made me sick. Meanwhile, a block away from the armory, Dave Sanders regains consciousness in the rubble of his collapsed apartment. He is literally buried alive. I uh, was in, I guess, shock and disbelief that something like that could happen. It was like being in a trash compactor. You felt pressure from every direction. Sanders is trapped in eight feet of wood, brick, and concrete. His body is numb from the waist down. The heavy debris is making it difficult for him to breathe, and he can only move one of his arms to dig through the wreckage. I was reaching to my back and pulling bricks off my back and other debris so that I could finally take a full breath. That's when he becomes aware of a new danger. I could feel something sticky and wet. I knew that was blood. I knew that, that if, if I'd lost a lot of blood, that I could conceivably pass out and it would be hours or even days before they'd find me in the amount of debris that I was buried in. There's only one thing Sanders can do. He takes a deep breath and starts screaming. I knew that I had one chance and that was, that was to yell and for help because there was no way I was going to pull myself out of that debris. did not know how many fatalities there are, but there certainly could be fatalities in Pierce City tonight. News of the Pierce City disaster quickly spreads throughout southwest Missouri. 35-year-old Pierce City resident Rob Egbert has survived the twister without injury. Now, he heads downtown to check on his parents who own a resale shop. He stops his car when he can no longer drive through the streets. I just 
parked the closest I could. And I went running around the building, found my mom, made sure she was okay, and my dad was off trying to help other people. Suddenly, Egbert smells gas. A Gulf War veteran, he's been trained to respond in emergency situations. He rounds up a few volunteers, and they leap into action. We were shutting off gas lines, you know, down through town. You know, just going one through the other, digging through the rubble and find the mains and shut them off. Then, Egbert hears a muffled noise coming from the old opera house. I just heard a, a faint, you know, you know, cry. I could moan, like moan in pain and I knew it was a person. Egbert tries to zero in on the sound. I heard a voice. I knew that he couldn't, he could hear me, but I could, I knew from what he said that he couldn't tell where I was. You know, that's what he just kept saying. I hear you. Um, keep, keep yelling so I can find you, you know, I'll get you. Egbert and two volunteers dig through the debris, inching closer and closer to Sanders' voice. I got further down inside there, and that's when we could hear him, and we realized he was like, The three men throw bricks and wooden planks off the pile. Finally, they see the top of Sanders' head. First thing I asked him was what his name was. I says, you know, talk to me. You know, I'm here, I'm not going to leave you until we get you out. Just keep talking to me. You know, and there's blood on his face, and you know, you see the fear in his eyes. It's hard to des describe, of course, the, 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 the relief of being found when you don't know whether you're going to live or die. After 40 minutes, the rescuers clear away enough wreckage to free Sanders' upper body, but his hips are still pinned beneath a heavy wooden beam. We tried to pull him up and he started screaming and said he was having a pain from his back, lower back. He begins fading in and out of consciousness. I lost so much blood that I don't think that, that I had a real good concept of time or or much else. He's like, I'm getting tired, I'm weak, I, you know, I'm, I just want to go to sleep. I'm like, no, 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 stay away. I'm hell or high water, we were going to get him out of there. May 4th, 2003, an F3 tornado has ripped the town of Pierce City, Missouri to shreds. 52-year-old Dave Sanders remains trapped under a pile of debris. Rescuer Rob Egbert and two other men work frantically to free his legs. Sanders is losing blood fast. It was just, it was getting to a point where we couldn't wait no longer. I could feel the bones in my crushed pelvis and I could feel it either cutting me or moving against each other and grinding sensation. It was just about more pain than I could bear at that point. Egbert and his fellow rescuers remove the last piece of a wooden beam off Sanders' body. After being trapped for nearly two hours, he is pulled to safety and taken to an area hospital. His injuries are extensive, but he is lucky to be alive. Just a block away, one Pierce City resident was crushed to death in the rubble of the National Guard Armory. Pierce City wasn't the only town in Southwest Missouri to suffer the wrath of the May 4th tornado outbreak. Within a 24-hour period, 76 twisters touched down across the Midwest, causing more than $160 million in damage and killing 37 people. Dave Sanders, like many in Pierce City, will never again underestimate the power of nature. If I had a better plan in mind and taken the warnings more seriously, perhaps it wouldn't have happened to me. Never become complacent when it comes to tornadoes. Three months after being injured, Sanders has to use crutches to walk. Still, his doctors believe he will make a full recovery. For Rob Egbert, the tornado's destructive force brought back a memory he would rather forget. Kind of reminds you of being overseas when I was in Desert Storm. Destruction everywhere. Buildings blown up. People screaming and crying. You see it and you're like, how can it be? Many lives in Pierce City have been put on hold as people try to rebuild. And though little is left of the town's Victorian charm, most people refuse to move away. Longtime resident Julie Johnson hopes to see this city flourish once again. 
I've always been telling people, I said, Pierce City is the people, not the buildings. It's in our hearts, and we, will, we make it. So we will make it and come back strong. I truly believe that. If you hear a tornado siren, but the skies are clear, can you assume that you are out of danger? We'll tell you when Storm Stories continues. So if you hear a tornado siren, but the skies are clear, can you assume that you're out of danger? Absolutely not. Tornadoes can develop quickly. Your view can be obstructed, making it impossible to see a twister coming. In Pierce City, people saw clear skies to the south, not realizing that a massive storm was spawning a tornado just to the west of them. Remember, all tornado sirens should be taken seriously. For Storm Stories, I'm meteorologist Jim Cantori. Your local forecast is next. This is the worst storm in the history.